Hello, and thank you for joining us as we look at vaccines, what's new, and certainly there's a lot new, and what's next. I'm ABC News Chief Medical Correspondent, Dr. Jen Ashton, and we are streaming now on ABC stations around the country. Today, we're gonna to answer your questions, take some questions in real time about the COVID vaccine and those booster shots. We have an incredible panel standing by, ready to talk to us. But first, we wanna begin with a man who has truly been front and center of this entire pandemic since day one, helping us navigate through what we know, what we don't know, and what we think we know about the virus and these vaccines. We're joined now by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Dr. Ashton. Thank you for having me. So, Tony, I want to get right into it. Um, first, can you clarify, in your opinion, what terms should we be using about these vaccines? Is it a third dose or a second dose or an additional dose, or is it truly a booster? Well, you know, what I believe will ultimately happen, but we certainly want to make sure that the data validates that opinion, is that I believe that when all is said and done, we're going to look back at this and say that this third shot would very much be part of the regimen that's the proper regimen for excellent degree of effectiveness together with durability. I hope that's the case. I believe there's a good chance. So for that reason, when you say booster, booster has different connotations. It's almost as if the vaccine that we thought was really good is waning it needs some help, it needs a boost, as opposed to the right and correct regimen will ultimately be that you need a prime, a couple of weeks, three, four weeks later, whatever that decides to be, it's three weeks for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna, and then several months later, after you give the immune system and the immune response to the particular virus in question, to mature, then that third shot really gets you over the hill with a high degree of effectiveness and of increased durability to the point where you may actually go for a considerable period of time. So it's tricky with the words, Jen. I mean, you, you wanna be careful because you don't know yet if this is going to be the proper regimen. So you stick with the word booster, but just keep in mind, it may turn out to be what you're really gonna to have to have for durable, excellent protection. And certainly, if I'm hearing you correctly, Tony, you're talking then, if you were talking about Johnson & Johnson, it would either be a two-dose regimen or a booster, but time will tell as you look at that data, correct? Exactly. I mean, the data that are coming out now from J&J &J about their second dose, which to them is equivalent to a boost. You know, there was always some consideration of whether or not J&J &J should have been a two-dose vaccine to begin with, there was some consideration about that. You get pretty good protection against the first shot, but this may turn out to be their version of what we're talking about, the boost for the mRNA. Uh, absolutely. Now let's get into how that data is being collected and tracked. And in particular, we're getting a lot of questions from people, I know I am even in my practice, about titers, antibody titers. And these are the blood tests that we can do, you and I can check on a patient. Um, it's not recommended right now that people check their titer levels to see if they're protected against SARS-CoV-2. But can you explain why that data has really yet to be published in terms of what is the magic number where those curves intersect, where the titer yeah. levels come down and the infection rates start to go up? It is not a precise system, Jen, but in general, you can get a good correlate of immunity that if you have a level of antibody that's above a certain level, which you know in animal studies and other studies that when you get below a certain cutoff, the chances of getting proper and, and optimal protection are lower. There is a study that has shown the correlate of immunity is associated with the level of antibody. The only thing that is deficient about that is that there's a lot more to it. So even though part of the story is that if you get an antibody level and there are different metrics that are being used, for example, if you look at the lab court, if you get you know, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, you're really in good shape. 
you know that. However, if someone doesn't get to that level, we don't know what the B cell memory component will do, what the T cell component will do. We're gonna learn that as time goes by. But the one thing we do know that a component of the correlate of immunity is the level of neutralizing antibody. We know that as a fact, even though we know it's not the only thing involved. And I think the, the argument or the disagreement you get and per perhaps even some of the confusion is that people wanna get their antibody level and they think that that's a precise indication of where they are in protection. And although it can be very, very helpful and indicative, it isn't the entire story. Um, let's stay on the vaccine question uh, for a second. Obviously, this is all about vaccines, but a question that we're getting a lot is, um, when will we know if it's safe to mix vaccine manufacturers? Certainly, we do that with other infectious diseases and other vaccine regimens. Uh, is it safe with COVID-19? And when will we have some kind of data uh, that can guide us with that? Well, I can give you a more precise answer to that question, Jen, than I gave you to the previous one, because we are doing clinical trials that are specifically directed at that. And what it's referred to as mix and match. So what you do is you get the three vaccines that have been given as the regimen, the two-dose Moderna, the two-dose Pfizer, and the one-dose J&J. And then you give as the quote booster shot, Moderna against Moderna, Moderna against J&J, &J, Moderna against Pfizer. The next group is you take J&J &J as the boost and say J&J &J against J&J, &J, J, J against Pfizer, J&J &J against Moderna and on and on. Right now we have the data of what it means when you give Moderna as a boost to the other three. Those data are being analyzed, they've been submitted for publication. So far, things look quite good. Within the next couple to few weeks, we're gonna get data on all of the mix and max combinations. So you're really talking a couple to three weeks rather than months to know what the answer to that is. Well, that's some good news, uh, Tony. Um, and, I, and I will be eagerly awaiting that data, I can assure you. Um, let me ask you specifically about the Delta variant. The Delta variant was sequenced uh, at the end of last year. Um, obviously, as uh, most people now have heard, the, one of the advantages with mRNA technology is that it can be readily adapted to new strains, new variants. Uh, it's been my understanding that that process takes about 100 days from sequencing change to manufacturing of the mRNA technology vaccines. Was it considered to make a Delta-specific vaccine? And if not, why? And uh, do you think that it should have been considered? Well, the companies themselves are making variant-specific vaccines in addition to the other work that everyone is trying to do on a pan-coronavirus type vaccine, which would cover all the variants. The one thing that people need to appreciate is that when you give a shot, be it a primary component or a boost, and you get a very high level of antibodies against the original prototype virus, which remember the vaccines that we are dealing with now were against the original Wuhan strain. Subsequent to that, we've had the 614 strain, the 115, we had the 117, we, we had multiple different strains. When you get the level of antibody high enough, it spills over in protection against the other variants. And the Israelis have very good data that, and as not only the Israelis, but others, that when you give a boost with for example, Pfizer over and above the two dose of Pfizer, you get a very high degree of antibody against in vitro showing against virtually all of the variants. And it's also shown that you increase multifold the protection against infection and severe disease if you boost someone with the original prototype 
So it looks like you don't absolutely need a variant specific vaccine if you get a high enough level of response against the original prototype, it will protect you against the variants. So let's, uh, you mentioned Israel. Uh, let's uh, stay with that country for a second because initially they became really a paradigm, I think, globally. I, I'm sure you would agree with the pace at which they vaccinated the majority of their population. Then they, quote, allegedly reopened very quickly and then saw subsequently extremely high case rates and hospitalization rates. Obviously, they're a much smaller country, um, but with their vaccine penetrance and the vaccine Pfizer holding up relatively well against the Delta variant, wh what do you think went wrong um, with what happened in Israel and how would you explain that? Well, I don't think it went wrong. What happened is that something came along that put a real monkey wrench in things, and that was the Delta variant. And as the Delta variant started to become overwhelmingly dominant for the few or the relatively smaller proportion of the population that wasn't vaccinated, they were getting infected and you were getting breakthrough infections. That's the entire concept that they were putting forth, that over time, they were seeing a waning of immunity against infection and mild to moderate disease that was really substantial, Jen, way down. And they were seeing a waning of immunity against severe disease, particularly in the elderly. And for that reason, that's why they made their decision based on their data that they were gonna give a boost. And what happened as the boost came just as I mentioned a moment ago, the levels of antibody against Delta went up extraordinarily high and you had a much, much greater, sometimes tenfold increase in the protection that was formally waning against not only infection and mild to moderate disease, but at least in the elderly against severe disease. So, what they've shown is that Delta was a bad actor and over a period of time, the immunity began to wane to the point where they needed to give the booster. Uh, in your opinion, Tony, what should we be emphasizing as we follow this? People at home follow what's going on with COVID here in this country. We're hearing about cases, um, but in your opinion, should we be looking at percent positivity in our surrounding community? Should we be focused on hospitalizations in our surrounding community or death rates? Or what, There are so many numbers on everyone's radar. What do you think is the most important one uh, for people listening at home to keep in mind? Well, before I answer that question, Jen, I want to say the most important thing we need to do that will influence all of those parameters is to get the 70 million people who are eligible to be vaccinated in this country who are not vaccinated. That is going to address all of those parameters. But obviously, the most important parameter is you don't want people to get so sick they're going to be hospitalized and ultimately die. We have 670,000 deaths, as you well know, in this country. We've got to prevent that. That's the primary thing. But also, I believe, uh, as an infectious disease person and an immunologist, that it will also be important to prevent infection and mild to moderate disease, because we should not take lightly that anything short of hospitalization is okay. There are plenty of people who get COVID who don't require hospitalization, who have significant disruption of their lives you know, including things like financial issues with not being able to go to work or even spreading it to vulnerable people. So clearly severe illness and hospitalization is very important. You don't wanna be or stressing the system. You know, you as a physician are very well aware of what that means because you've seen it firsthand, but there are other aspects of it that we wanna make sure we pay attention to and don't just say only hospitalization is the only thing we're worried about. You mentioned a vulnerable population, Dr. Fauci. Let's talk about an incredibly vulnerable population, which is uh, the pediatric uh, age group under the age of 12. 
Um, yes, some encouraging data this week from Pfizer in children five through 11, but speak directly to parents now who are very frightened, uh, caught between a rock and a hard place, scared of COVID with their children, but scared of uh, a new vaccine. What's the latest on that in this age group? Well, first of all, nothing is going to get um, regulatory approved for anyone unless our regulatory authority, the FDA, who are the gold standard in the world, feel that the risk benefit ratio for the children is favorable enough to get them vaccinated. So I think what we need to tell parents, mothers and fathers, and people who care for the children, that children need to be protected. Vaccines, historically and specifically this vaccine, is extraordinarily effective and safe. Now, obviously, when you get to children, particularly one issue in the mRNA vaccine of the very rare occurrence of myocarditis that you wanna balance the risk benefit. And even though that's very, very rare, you wanna make sure that the vaccine is gonna protect them against an infection, that if you get infected, the chance of your getting that adverse event overwhelmingly is greater than what the vaccine would do. So when you put all that together, the FDA will look at the data, the most recent of which is from Pfizer now, who's looked at 11 to five. At the end of the day, what we would like to see is the children vaccinated and protected within their own system. They mean their own body is protected as opposed to having to always surround them with people who are vaccinated and having a bit of a cocoon around them. You want to have their own protection. And that's what we're looking for. You know, one of the things that people don't realize uh, well, maybe they do who are paying attention, that even though children have a much less of a likelihood to get a severe outcome when they get COVID compared to an elderly person or someone who has an underlying condition, the pediatric hospitals now are being stressed with children who got ill enough to get hospitalized. We can't take that lightly. And that's the reason why we feel strongly about getting them vaccinated. So with the regimen being a three or four week interval, depending on let's say Pfizer goes first since they are tend to be first just chronologically, um, it could be potentially into January until the first round of children have that full two weeks post second dose level of immunity, correct? Well, let's say in a couple of weeks, and again, we never want to get ahead of the FDA, let them do their thing and don't make any suggestions for them. But let's assume that it's like three weeks from now that you're talking about into the middle to end of October, then kids start getting it, they get their first dose. And three weeks later, in the third week of November, they get their boost. Two weeks later, you're talking about end of November, December. If they give the approval at the time. And I want to stay away from sure. making any predictions for the FDA. Well, I'm going to ask you to make maybe some other predictions as we wrap up, uh, Dr. Fauci, because everyone knows that you're a big baseball fan. So wh who are you liking in the postseason um, in the very little amount of time that I'm sure you have to uh, look at professional sports? I always get into trouble with that, <laughs> but I must tell you, uh, I am a staunch Washington national fan, even though they are likely not going to be there. But I have to tell you, my heart was broken when Trey Turner and Max Scherzer went to L.A. <laughs> that was tough to take. That was tough to take. OK, but are you are there a couple of teams that you're you're you think are looking good at this? point? Well, in this you know, season? Jen, I have to be honest with you. I have not been able to follow baseball because you know what my life has been we talk yes. frequently on the phone yeah so I, I don't think I want to go on record of making any predictions because I am not as fluent in what's going on now <laughs> as I usually am okay well smart man but uh, we'll try to send you some updates and again we appreciate you always taking the time uh, to, to spend your expertise with us at ABC so uh, thank you again Tony Dr. Anthony Fauci um, we'll talk to you soon
Thanks again, Jen. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I want to bring in the rest of our panel now uh, to continue this discussion, and then we will take some of your questions in real time uh, as well. So I want to introduce Heidi Arthur from the Ad Council, Rita Carrion from Unidos US, and Dr. Mara Minguez from New York Presbyterian Columbia Medical Center, and Dr. Angelica Kotkamp from NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for spending some time with this, and um, I look forward to hearing all of your perspectives. Um, Dr. Kotkamp, I want to start with you. Um, you're an infectious disease specialist. There's been a lot back and forth on these additional shots, booster shots. Um, for people who are concerned about getting the vaccine and they maybe overcame their concerns getting their initial doses, now they're confronted with possibly getting additional doses. Uh, how do you convince them risk benefit that this is a good idea? Hi, Jen, thank you for having me here. Definitely the conversation has um, different levels. I will say that uh, it's not always an easy conversation and it's not always a successful conversation in the first attempt, which is, which is not bad. Sometimes people need more time and need to hear the reasons from different sources at different times. I have had patients that in my first encounter, we go over questions and uh, they bring up all the things they hear in the media or from friends. I answer their questions and then at the end, I'm like, so you're ready? And then I face a big no or like, okay, I need to think about it. But uh, next visit, they are ready or they come with their CDC card and they are like, look, doctor, I did it. So the fact that at that first conversation, a person says uh, that is not ready, that doesn't mean that they're going to be, uh, it's going to be a negative answer for the rest. It's going to be each person needs time. And I like to give them that time and, and have the opportunity to answer their unique questions. And just a quick follow-up for you, just in, in the clinical expertise um, of infectious disease, have you been surprised recently or certainly throughout uh, the course of this pandemic with how sick various patients have been that, you know, in medicine, we expect certainly certain people who are high risk to begin with, but um, what has surprised you about some of the way this virus uh, really attacks and affects people who maybe didn't come uh, to your hospital or your clinic with any pre-existing uh, medical conditions or weren't high risk until they became really sick with COVID? Yes, um, back last year in April when everything started, and as you know, in New York, we were hit uh, very bad. The patients that I saw the most in my hospital were patients that are coming from backgrounds that are common with my background. They're Latin Americans, uh, they're Hispanics. And uh, I saw this population getting extremely sick without necessarily a lot of medical uh, underlying conditions. I remember very well patients young that they were just working class patients, uh, less than 40 years old and being in the ICU intubated with full oxygen support and, and mechanical ventilation. It was really hard because in many of those cases, I was the person speaking in Spanish to their family members. And uh, how do you explain to their parents that their young son is in that status and that it's very unlikely that things will look positive after the hospital admission. So it, it was very shocking to see healthy people being admitted to the hospital with severe illness. And this continues to happen in the setting of Delta. Delta has been a, a very bad actor, has been showing up with very bad profiles and we see young people, pregnant women, getting in the hospital in situations that we will hate to see anyone. Um, Heidi, Arthur, I wanna bring you in, uh, Chief Campaign Development Officer for the Ed Council. And I wanna ask you about something that is squarely within your wheelhouse. Um, the communication uh, and confusion in terms of the messaging about the vaccine. Uh, it's evolving, it changes, Seemingly by the day, people have what I like to refer to as medical headline whiplash. Um, can you speak a little bit about the importance of 
messaging and communication and how you think um, it has been to walk that fine line between keeping people informed and understanding that we still don't know everything about this virus and the vaccines. As first, I wanna say thank you so much for having us here today for such an important conversation. And I think, you know, we learned very early on from day one that we were going to have to cut through a lot of confusion, a lot of um, information that was changing very rapidly. And what we learned that, um, you know, we needed to communicate and honor was having empathy and understanding that people have questions and honoring the fact that it is overwhelming and a big decision for many people to make. So we had to ensure that we were listening to our different target audiences, understanding that it's not a one size fits all message because certain barriers are different for, for, for certain communities for very good reason. And having you know, trusted voices at the forefront was essential to communicating very effectively. And for many, that's a healthcare provider. For parents, it's a pediatrician. For um, other people, it could be a faith leader. For young adults, it's family and friends. So ensuring that it's trusted messengers and that the messages are really in keeping with where people are on their own personal journey and that we're closing the gap in terms of combating misinformation with credible information from trusted resources at every point along the way. Yeah, I want to hear from... Um... Mata and Rita on that, because I think that what you mentioned, Heidi, which is so important and, and in my opinion, has been missing in this, certainly since we've had a vaccine and now three vaccines, since, which is going on since December of last year, is um, people who have not been vaccinated have been vilified. Um, which is something that when you're dealing in public health and clinical medicine and you counsel patients on behaviors on a regular basis, um, as my colleagues on this panel and I do on a regular basis, that discussion starts with respect and uh, the principle in biomedical ethics of patient autonomy. And it's our job to counsel with correct factual scientific information but it starts and ends with a respect uh, for that person uh, and their autonomy. So Dr. Minguez, speak to what you've seen up in Washington Heights and your communities in the Bronx, New York Presbyterian, uh, Columbia Medical Center, my alma mater, and um, in particular, the adolescent and pediatric population that you specialize in and how this dialogue uh, has evolved in your opinion. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, this is really an important question because when you are dealing as a pediatrician with a parent and the patient, when um, you're thinking of messaging, it's really key to speak to both. There's a diet that you're speaking to. And also when you speak to the, to the parent, it's important to give them the tools to have that conversation because you mentioned something key and that is autonomy. And that adolescent, next to the parent also has autonomy that we have to validate. And I have to tell you about an experience in which I was talking to the mother for quite some time to try to discuss and, and make her aware of the scientific side of the vaccine. And she was not budging. She was definitely hesitant about it. And I looked at the patient and said, hey, what do you think? Why don't we talk about what you feel about the vaccine and your knowledge? And to tell you the truth, it only took that adolescent to have that conversation with the parent for the mother to say, hey, if that is what you want, I'm here for you. So please, I would say to everyone to ensure to talk to the patient, but if that patient is a child or an adolescent, to ensure that you also give that person that patient autonomy. I'm so happy you shared that. And um, I take care of a lot of teenager patients as well, but as a mom, that really resonated with me. <laughs> uh, sometimes we, we don't give our kids uh, as much credit as, as definitely they deserve. Um, Rita, speak about the underserved communities and um, not just the impact of COVID and this pandemic, but in particular, the vaccine. Where are we now and, and how much work is there uh, to do that you are working on? 
Dr. Jen, thanks for having us and, and with such a great prestigious uh, panel of, of female leaders um, in the country. And I just want to say that, you know, to come back a little bit about um, what you mentioned earlier on respect. You know, it's part of our values as Unidos U.S. We're the largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization in the country. We have more than 300 community-based organizations as our, our affiliates and um, community health centers that we work with. So also as a mother, you know, the respect, the, the ganas, the compassion, the listening, the opportunity for us to be able to be present in the moment is super important. Um, and I think early on for a lot of our um, affiliates, which are many of them have promotoras de salud or community health workers, uh, they had a lot of questions. They were hearing a lot of rumors. We were getting all the information in the language that we're more, most comfortable with. And so they came to us and we, came, we, we, we actually reached out to them as well. This is what is it that we need? You know, how can we be able to ensure that we have language in, in the language and in, um, in the places where you need it the most? Um, so then that a lot of the misinformation doesn't get pushed out um, and, and then spread out. I think that's just super important. I think we have, you know, as I think everybody knows in this room, um, and out in the community, especially the Latino community, that we've been hit significantly. We've suffered but not only um, economically, but also physically, and I want to say mentally. Uh, as a Latina mom, it's very difficult um, to be able to know that your child is still not protected. Um, I have a nine-year-old son, you know, he's back in school, and um, that's, you know, really hard for, for many of us that we know that this is, this is important for them to be in the classroom to learn um, and not to be, um, you know, isolated, you know, at home. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, challenges that we have, but, you know, we, we have made significant progress over the last couple of months. You know, we two times, three times we're likely to get um, di diagnosed with COVID. We had, you know, a recent survey with Latino parents um, and they felt more that now more than last year at this time that this pandemic is not over. Um, and the reason for that is because of their own personal experience. They have seen um, family members die. They have seen, they themselves have also have gotten COVID. Um, and they have suffered from, you know, both the physical and, and the health reasons. So a lot of the work that we've been doing on Esperanza Hope for All campaign and the work that we've been partnering with the Ad Council is really trying to make sure that we're getting the message out there in, in language um, and, and saying, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to have at, at questions. Um, you know, there's so much information out there. And, you know, I really enjoyed um, your conversation with Dr. Fauci. Uh, this afternoon because you know it's trying to figure out are we calling this a booster or are we calling this a third dose we don't know this and i think this is the element that it's important to be able to to recognize the space that we're all in and that we all need to be patient but at the same time our lives are our states um so i think that's critical I, you mentioned rita um psychologically difficult, the social impacts of this pandemic and this confusion. I, I would like to go through um, for the, the rest of the panelists and get your thoughts on that, because, um, you know, I, I like to say in medicine, we really treat the whole body, we should be treating the whole body. There's usually a head connected to a body. And when we could be focused on a body part, we always have to remember the spirit um, and the mind and psyche and psychology involved. So um, Dr. Kotkamp, why don't you start and just talk about that a little bit for people who are watching and listening now and feeling this relentless anxiety and stress and confusion and uncertainty, um, what you think they can do about it and uh, what impact you've seen it have on your patients? Yes, definitely. We have seen that a lot, uh, not only among patients, um, but also between us, right? We are the providers, we are here for the patients always. And uh, the pandemic has been extremely hard in all of us, the communities, and also in the healthcare workers. I think uh, that none of us were expecting that the pandemic was gonna last this long. I, I remember myself 
making, telling my patients, okay, we're going to have the next time a televisit, but then maybe in six months we'll see each other and everything is going to be back to normal. And, and now look, we are like near two years on this and uh, it's taking a big toll in all of us. I think uh, moving forward, we need to be supportive of each other. We need to be gentle. We need to be uh, uh, have empathy and, and respect for the work that we do and respect for what people have gone through. Many patients have lost many family members. I am aware of families that lost kids that lost both of their parents or uh, a big number of family members. And so it's, it's a tough time and we are all on this. I think we just need to be uh, very care about each other and be very, very gentle about how we interact and how we treat each other because we are all going through the same, through the same pandemic. And oh, I think that's so well said. Um, Heidi, what's your opinion about the psychological stress and anxiety that people are feeling and does it make communicating about the importance of the vaccines and the latest in this pandemic more challenging? It does because people are exhausted. I mean, they're fatigued with all of the messaging and you know, for us, it means really staying on top of what's the most important thing on people's minds so that we can really address it head on and help allay concerns or acknowledge where the concerns are and provide access to resource and information. And I would also say just dealing directly with overall mental health and wellness is so important now for families. And there are things that people can look to and resources for people to understand how to check in with their kids to make sure that, you know, you're moving beyond it's okay or I'm okay. And you know, for young adults to understand the importance of checking in with each other and talking about it. So all of this is so critical and overwhelming, but definitely has to be considered as we message. You're so right, critical and oftentimes seemingly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, Mara, Dr. Minguez, you're again, pediatric adolescent specialist. Um, I'm the mother of two college age uh, you know, there'll always be our babies, children, young adults. Um, I've seen the stress of this pandemic on them. And I, and I shared publicly um, my daughter who's in college, Chloe, uh, fully vaccinated, of course, had a breakthrough case of COVID that was picked up at her college. They were doing surveillance testing um, several times a week and she tested positive. It was confirmed. And she had to go into 10 days of, of course, isolation. Minimal symptoms was the good news because of the vaccine, um, thankfully. But the, the psychological impact of that isolation was way more difficult than the physical um, manifestation. So what are you seeing in, in the adolescent and college age group? And how can parents help our children through that, because that I think can be as hard, if not harder than the infection itself. Absolutely, and thank you for talking about that because when we talk about kids and adolescents, um, we don't really un, you know, think about the mental, the well-being as a, as a symptom, right? We always talk about the physical manifestations of COVID, but really do not focus on how the mental health aspect of it in our kids and young adults, they're with us. They're experiencing everything that we're experiencing. They're experiencing great disruption. They're also experiencing loss. Many adults have died, but many of those adults had kids in their lives that have now experienced that loss. So um, thank you for, for that because it's important in their development is important. Socialization as part of their development is key to continue in-person learning. Um, the educational outcomes that are going to also be a consequence of the disruption, it's something that we're going to have to think about and worry about in the future. And what I would tell parents is, just like Heidi mentioned, which was beautifully said, is communication. Talk about it. Engage in conversation about how they feel. And we are also concerned with our own worries that sometimes we may forget to do that. So I would definitely say to any parent out there who has not asked your child how they're doing 
in terms of COVID, please, you know, use tonight at dinner for that conversation because it's key. Oh, I, that is such good advice. Uh, great topic specifically pointed question to ask tonight um, around the dinner table. Rita, um, are we making progress in getting people in underserved communities who already at baseline um, may have difficulty with accessing the healthcare system in terms of testing or vaccination or even just education? Are we making progress? And um, what, what can people listening to this, if they are in an underserved community, either geographically um, or in any other way, what can they do to get vaccinated or get tested, um, if anything? So I would say, yes, we're making significant progress. And, and just in the work that we've been looking at for the Latino community, um, even the last couple of months, we've seen a significant amount of folks wanting to get vaccinated. Um, and I think the element here is we're trying to reduce a lot of the barriers. So we're working with um, both private companies as well as the federal government to relieve those barriers. So what I'm talking about is transportation. Um, ensuring that you know folks have transportation um, to go to get a vaccine, um, information in language, um, recognizing that 70% of Latinos speak another language and that we have this information in the language that they are most comfortable in speaking and reading. And, and, um, and then I think the other thing also is that we have, you know, have a collaborative uh, a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control, where we're working with 33 community-based organizations and community health centers to do vaccination events. So these are working in with community health centers who are safety net providers in medically underserved communities. So then that your the time and the and the effort um, to be able to have promotoras, you know, who are trusted messengers for them to be able to to access the vaccines and also to inform them that they're free. I think the other thing that we saw really early on is that uh, many were turned away because they were asked for social security numbers or different documentations and made it difficult. I think we had really good uh, opportunity work with our retail uh, centers to be able to say, listen, we, we, this can't happen. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We need to make sure that people have access to this information, to the vaccines right there. And so we have pop-up sites. This weekend, we're doing a mobile tour. We're going, we've been doing a part of a series of mobile tours, um, going to bodegas, going to flea markets, going to uh, grocery stores where most Latinos go to, um, for us to be able to inform them and saying, okay, here's how you go about in getting it and having a place to for them to to talk with um, and answer their questions because I think people still have questions. Um, the one thing in our survey that we had with Latino parents recently was that majority of the Latino parents um, were more likely um, to vaccinate their eligible um, children. That's significant. And they were more likely to also be open to having mandates um, in the schools or in restaurants or in areas because they really felt that nine and 10 of these Latino parents were very worried about their children under the age of 12 becoming seriously ill. And we heard the long-term effects that something like this can happen. So I think it is being in community, um, making significant progress. There are continuing to be barriers like time off from employers, allowing um, individuals to be able to, to uh, you know, go and get a vaccine and or if you do have symptoms after the vaccine, that, you know, a time off to be able to recover from that. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of work that we have accomplished, but there's a lot more work for us to be done, especially with the Delta variant. I agree with that. Uh, I want to get to our viewer questions. We have uh, some great ones here. And uh, I would actually like if the panelists, if you're all up for this to hear uh, quickly from whoever wants to answer, I want this to be a, a little looser and more organic. So for the first question from Paula, who's from Queens, New York, she asked, for people who missed the second dose for circumstances beyond their control, can they still take that second dose if the first dose was taken six months or so before? And if so, do we know how effective it will be so many months after the first dose? So basically, if you're out of that three or four week regimen time window, uh, what should they do? And 
I guess I said I wasn't going to ask, but I guess we should start with our infectious disease expert, Dr. Kottkamp. You want to take this one? Sure. Um, Paula, thank you for the question. It's uh, somehow a common situation that some people find themselves in the circumstances that you are. And so I think that six months, it's a very big gap between the two doses based on what we know of the vaccines with the data that is available. I definitely recommend you to get your vaccine as soon as you can. We, we're seeing what's going on with Delta and uh, this is something that we cannot take lightly. So please get your vaccine uh, again. I think, because six months is a big gap, potentially for you, the best uh, option will be to just redo this schedule again. So if you're gonna go with one of the three available vaccines, just make sure you get the full schedule, uh, if it's a two dose or if it's a one dose. But uh, it's a big gap and we don't have enough data in that particular scenario, but uh, I, I feel that you should be fine after the two doses. Anyone else wanna throw anything in on that one? Okay, so uh, second question is from Nancy from Brick, New Jersey, who says, I'm 75 and I have some health issues, but I got the Moderna shot and the only one that seemed to be approved and available is now the Pfizer shot. I guess she's talking about a, a booster. Can you get this one or do you have to wait until the Moderna one is approved? So um, I'm going to assume that Nancy is really asking now about what, what I spoke to Dr. Fauci about, the so-called mix and match um, regimen. Uh, Mara, do you want to take that one? Sure. And I, I would have to echo what, what he mentioned in terms of the data not being fully available um, for that purpose. Um, absolutely. But if one of the things that I would suggest is actually if they have the ability to get it, um, to do so. But again, one of the things that's really key, and I always mention in any panel or any conversation, is that these conversations actually are a supplement to the conversation with your provider, because they know you better than anyone. So this is a supplement, and it's really key to sit down and talk about the time frame and your vulnerability and how important it is for you to get it at this time. So definitely do that. But um, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, data is not fully available and the studies are ongoing. We've gotten a lot of questions about the vaccine uh, during pregnancy. Um, and so uh, that is my medical specialty. I'm gonna start with the answer, but then I, I would really like to hear from, from all of you, uh, your views about this particularly vulnerable population, which is pregnant women. Uh, now we have, which is pretty rare in medicine and science, but we do have uniform consensus and support from the CDC, the FDA, ACOG, which is the American College of OBGYNs, and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, recommending and supporting this COVID-19 vaccine in all trimesters of pregnancy for women who are considering pregnancy and or women who are breastfeeding. Um, why that is finally the case and there's uniform consensus um, is because we have data on tens of thousands of women who were vaccinated during their pregnancies. There were no significant safety signals. Um, so that's on one good side of this science um, in terms of the support and the data. And on the other side is the risk. Um, and I know that uh, Dr. Kotkamp, you can speak to this. Dr. Mingas, you can speak to this. And I know Heidi and Rita, this is very much on your radar as well. We know that pregnant women are an incredibly vulnerable high-risk population, not only to this virus and upper respiratory infection, uh, but to influenza as well. I've mentioned myself uh, on the air multiple times that as a practicing OBGYN, the only patient I ever had die was a 16-year-old Hispanic teenager who was pregnant and died of influenza. Um, so I take this very, very seriously. So we have the known risks of COVID, to the pregnant woman and her fetus, and as well as her newborn. And we have the safety profile. Uh, and that's why you have all of these professional organizations uh, recommending this. Um, but can we all go through um, the messaging and the science and the counseling to this population, not just to pregnant women, of course, but to anyone 
who knows a pregnant woman who cares about this. Um, Rita, do you want to go first, actually? Sure. Uh, you know, this is very personal in, in so many different ways, um, because it's actually one of the, the number one question we get from many Latinas um, is, will this vaccine affect my baby? And oftentimes, it's often influenced also by their partner, too, um, and the spread of information or misinformation um, that they're hearing. So being able to, um, number one, have clear information um, to and, and actually working with influencers like we have done um, to be able to answer these questions are super important. Um, and having um, that information and also to make sure that they are also talking to their providers, um, to their OBGYN doctors and, and um, being able to ask those questions. You know, I know that many women have, have, have gotten pregnant, um, have gotten COVID and are fearful about what will happen or not accessing healthcare. And so I think it's super important for us to really be able to answer this question. And thank you, Dr. Jen, for, for your leadership to be able to bring this to light because I think it's one of the most common questions that we get. And it's often because of misinformation or disinformation. So, you know, it's okay for us to have these questions, but before you share that information online, um, it's, it's making sure that who is saying this and, and can you trust them? What is the evidence? Do you do the trustworthy sources, you know, back them up? Um, those are critical questions in addition to finding out, um, you know, uh, and getting the care that you need. Heidi, how do you think um, the Ad Council is targeting, uh, I, I hate to use the word targeting, but addressing the concerns of uh, pregnant women and the people who care about pregnant women? Yeah, I think, first of all, I would put five exclamation points on everything Rita just said. And it starts where we you know, started off this conversation about having respect, empathy, and understanding. So all of our messaging is really geared towards providing people with information from trusted voices. So I think if anybody out there is confronting a conversation you know, with someone who has these concerns, it's really important to not dismiss it and not to point fingers or to vilify someone for feeling a certain way because people are scared. So it's pointing people to the right resources from the most trusted voices and of course, you know, first and foremost, healthcare providers. And um, Dr. Kotkamp, what about, what about what you can say just clinically about this vulnerable population? Absolutely. This uh, population is extremely vulnerable. We have uh, two people, right? So it's taking the vaccine is an act of love, not only for you, your family, but also for your baby. And I think we have enough evidence that supports the safety of these vaccines. From the biological standpoint, the vaccine doesn't really reach the place where genes are stored. So if this vaccine doesn't get there, then there is no uh, a biological explanation why a vaccine will modify, say, a genetic material. So it is important to understand also the biology of this. The vaccine goes to a very different place where the genes are stored and therefore there is no messing up with genes. And therefore your baby and you are going to be protected. That's the best gift that you can give to your baby. And Dr. Mingas, in terms of newborns um, and, and to circle it back to vaccines and, and really the, the central topic of this town hall that we're doing right now, uh, even eventually when there is an authorized or approved vaccine for babies, it will start at six months of age. So speak about that vulnerable time period in the neonate between birth and six months where there could be and needs to be some degree of protection that the pregnant woman can pass along to that neonate or newborn from having been vaccinated herself. Absolutely, absolutely. And one thing that I want to message, um, go back to a little bit is the messaging. Important to really uh, describe the medical and scientific component. And there's great data, right, for the recommendation. We also have to listen to the parent because they usually, that component, they understand and hear. It's, it's, the, it's the component of fear, 
that they're very worried about. And we need to really talk about that and tease it out. It's more of the emotional component. Um, and now going back to, of course, that period that you mentioned from zero to six months, it is important for them to understand how they can be protected to their child, definitely. And that goes along with other different diseases as well. And it's being careful, but also providing them with any tools that we have available in the medical field to protect them even further. Um, I want to bring in a, a question. We got a great question from Erin in Texas, um, who oh, my arms have gotten shorter, so forgive me. <laughs> I need my glasses. Mm -hmm. I have RA and I'm on two immune suppressant drugs. Um, this is such a common question from people with autoimmune conditions. I just received the third dose of the vaccine a few weeks ago. Can I finally feel free to do some more social things such as go to small parties, eat out, or do I still need to take extra precaution? And does the same go for my family? Who wants to take that? Sure, I'll I take that. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, go ahead, Dr. Kotkamp. So Aaron, um, congratulations on getting your third dose. Uh, that was the right move. Definitely for people like you that are taking immunosuppressive medications, this is a clear recommendation with solid evidence. So congratulations on that. Now about the other measurements, uh, we all need to continue doing that while we have this high tide of Delta. So this is not really the time to relax public health measurements. We still are under risk of getting infected. And so until the wave goes away and we get to very low rates, then that will be an okay moment to relax measurements. For now, keep using your mask, limit your social gathering and make sure people are also using masks and trying to stay six feet away and all these other uh, public health measurements. Excellent advice. And Mara, go ahead. You you want I cut you off there. No, 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 no. My apologies. And just echo Dr. Kanka. Definitely, I would mention to everyone, just really stay close to the CDC guidelines. Um, their, their recommendations are our are, are gold standard and definitely continue to keep looking through that. And like it was mentioned, it is great that you got the vaccine. It is just important to see what the data is out there and Delta variant, it's still of great concern. So we still wanna to continue to protect you. And you know, as we wrap up, I, I wanna also offer um, to our viewers who are watching right now, uh, something that I think is really important just to navigate this whiplash and the ever-changing science and headlines that we're getting on these vaccines. Uh, no vaccine in medicine is 100% effective. Um, really, the endpoints for the clinical trials were to save lives and help reduce the risk of hospitalization. And then, of course, we want to see and hope to see vaccines that reduce the risk of transmission, that lower severity if we are to get infected. Um, but I think we have to remember that there is no 100 uh, percent holy grail that's perfect in the world of vaccines, but that it is the best tool in our toolbox right now. Um, and then in terms of assessing risk as we get into the fall and holidays and school, uh, it really comes down to six elements, time, place, people, space whether masks are used and whether people or you are vaccinated. Um, so as we've heard from our physician panelists, you know, to stratify your own risks in places outdoors, safer than indoors, masks, safer than unmasked, distance between people more greater than uh, less in terms of protection, and then density, how crowded the area is and how many of those people are vaccinated. And until we can get more of our population protected with the vaccine, I think everyone uh, would find it useful to keep those factors in mind. And we will certainly stay on top of the ever-changing headlines uh, because they are definitely coming at us at a fast and furious pace. But I really want to thank everyone uh, for watching today and for submitting your questions to us at ABC News. Uh, we will continue to answer them and try the best we can to bring together great panelists like we did today. So um, Rita Carrion, Dr. Mara Minguez, Heidi Arthur, and Dr. Angelica Kotkamp, thank you so much for joining me. And of course, to Dr. Anthony Fauci. And thank you all 
for taking time of your busy day to join us today here at ABC News. I'm Dr. Jennifer Ashton, ABC News Chief Medical Correspondent. Thanks again. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.